into our penultimate class, <laughs> second to last class in this series. Um, and uh, yeah, next week, the 26th, we'll get to the very end of the musical of Hamilton. It's been a wonderful journey with so many of you. And I know some of you jumped in in the middle, that's okay too. And I know some of you have been with me from the beginning of our year. Um, and today, funny enough, the last song is not where Hamilton gets killed. It's the second to last song. So that's what we're looking at today. It's a little bit of an intense, well, it's all very intense at the end. It's very emotional. So um, I need another disclaimer, like I did a couple of weeks ago. This is an emotionally intense scene because it is, it is the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And uh, you see them point and shoot and you see Hamilton die. And he gives this sort of final speech um, as, as he dies, he talks about his legacy. He talks about um, his wife, Eliza. There's a very touching moment. He says, as he's about to die, he says, Eliza, take your time. I'll see you on the other side. Oh, I mean, you can't. <laughs> um, it's, very, it's very beautiful and it's very intense. So that's just by way of, of warning for those who haven't seen or heard this song before. Um, but we're really gonna be focusing more on uh, Aaron Burr, on the one who shoots Alexander Hamilton. Um, as I mentioned previously, he is the narrator of the musical. He brings us through the story of Alexander Hamilton's rise and through his jealousy of Hamilton. And um, what happened just before this scene is essentially Hamilton blocked Aaron Burr from becoming president. It's sort of a little bit complicated, but um, what Aaron Burr says is when I look at the patterns in my life, anytime I didn't get what I wanted, it was because you had something to do with it, Alexander Hamilton. And he's just had enough. At first it was friendship, it was then friendship and jealousy, then it was just animosity and jealousy. And finally he's overcome with rage, challenges Hamilton to a duel. Um, and in the duel, we see that Ham Hamilton points his uh, gun to the sky, but Burr shoots him. Um, and there's this repetition of a previous scene because Hamilton's son was killed in a duel and he had given his son the same advice. He said, point your pistol to the sky and his son gets killed. And you see in, in the scene, they say, in the song, excuse me, they say this was the very same spot that his son died. Um, and there's a moment where there's an actor who comes on the stage that is his son. Um, the people who are who are deceased are are sort of in white, white light. Well, actually, almost everyone there was is in white except for the main characters. But you see him there, and then you see Hamilton reach for him, and then he goes away. Um, so uh, be ready for a very. It, it's not a short song. It's a five minute song. It's going to take us through the duel, and at the end, it's Aaron Burr reflecting on how he is now become, he's become the villain in your history because of this act of murder, of, of killing Alexander Hamilton. Um, he's become the villain in, in, in history and yet he still remains human, right? That's the, the beauty of the, this art, of this, of this musical is that we still can relate to Aaron Burr at the end of it. Um, and, and, and he has regret at the end. We're going to compare it to the, the killing of Abel, the story of Cain and Abel. Cain too is overcome with jealousy and in a fit of rage, he kills his brother and afterwards has a moment of regret. And Cain is the, is the ultimate murderer, right? He's the first murderer, the first violence in the Torah. Um, and we'll look at then the regret that happens and we'll look at the motive of what made him kill his brother. So um, here we go. We are going to see a video version of the song. You'll notice it, it is not that smooth um, Disney Plus uh, recording of it. It looks like it's a couple of different like home videos of the musical, but the, but the sound is good. And I felt it was better than not seeing this very important scene visually. So we're going to start now with the world was wide enough. The world was wide enough is a line that doesn't come until the very end where Aaron Burr realizes, I should have known that the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me. I could have both coexisted. 
So here we go. The duel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are ten things you need to know. Number one. We rode across the Hudson at dawn. My friend William P. Van Ness signed on as my number, number two. two. Hamilton arrived with his crew, Nathaniel Pendleton and the doctor that he knew. Number three. I watched Hamilton examine the terrain. I wish I could tell you what was happening in his brain. This man is poisoned by political pursuits. Most disputes die and no one shoots. Number four. Hamilton drew first position, looking to the world like a man on a mission. This is a soldier with a marksman's ability. The doctor turned around so he could have deniability. Five. Now I didn't know this at the time, but we were near, near the same spot. My son died, is that why? He examined his gun with such rigor. I watched as he methodically fiddled with the trigger. Seven. Confession time, here's what I got. My fellow soldiers will tell you I'm a terrible shot. Number eight. Your last chance to negotiate. Send in your second, see if they can set the record straight. They won't teach you this in your classes, but look it up. Hamilton was wearing his glasses. Why? If not to take deadly aim, it's him or me. The world will never be the same. I had only one thought before the slaughter. This man will not make an orphan of my daughter. Number nine. Look him in the eye, aim no higher. Summon all the courage you require, then count. One, two, three. I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Is this where it gets me? On my feet, several feet ahead of me. I see it coming. Do I run or fire my gun or let it be? There is no beat, no melody. Burr, my first friend, my enemy. Maybe the last face I ever see. If I throw away my shot, is this how you remember me? What if this bullet is my legacy? Legacy. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song someone will sing for me. America, you great unfinished symphony, you sent for me. You let me make a difference. A place where even orphan immigrants can leave their fingerprints and rise up. I'm running out of time, I'm running in my time's up. Wise up, eyes up. I catch a glimpse of the other side. Lawrence leads a soldier's chorus on the other side. My son is on the other side. He's with my mother on the other side. Washington is watching from the other side. Teach me how to say goodbye. Rise up, rise up, rise up, Eliza. My love, take your time. I'll see you on the other side. Raise a glass to free. He aims his pistol at the sky. Wait! I strike him right between his ribs. I walk towards him, but I am ushered away. They row him back across the Hudson. Tells me you'd better hide. They say Angelica and Eliza were both at his side when he died. Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes. History obliterates in every picture it paints. It paints me in all my mistakes. When Alexander aimed at the sky, he may have been the first one to die, but I'm the one who paid for it. I survived, but I paid for it. Now I'm the villain in your history. I was too young and blind to see. I should have known. 
So there you have it. Wow, right? I don't know if you noticed, um, I didn't explain it before, but the bullet is actually carried by one of the actors slowly across the stage. So while they have of Hamilton giving his whole speech with no music and no rhythm, uh, the bullet is slowly traveling, right? She's holding the bullet like this. Um, it's, it's very dramatic. Oof, there's so much there to unpack. We'll take a brief look at the lyrics before we go to our text. Here we go. So I think it's important that it, it makes sure to um, present Burr as very vulnerable. Um, here where he says, confession time, my fellow soldiers will tell you I'm a terrible shot, right? He, he's very afraid. Um, and remember that moment where, where he says, uh, uh, I had only one thought before the slaughter, this man will not make an orphan of a daughter. He is, he, he's relatable and, and he wants what's best for his family. Um, and it takes him courage, summon all the courage you require, right? He sees Hamilton is wearing his glasses and he's a terrible shot. And then he shoots and we have um, this lengthy speech. Hamilton's very lengthy speech here in the middle. Um, I imagine death so much, it feels more like a memory. That's a line he's given a couple of times before in the play. Um, so it's almost like he's escaped death narrowly since childhood, right? It's, it's a miracle that he's alive. It's something that Eliza has said to him. And now finally death has him. Um, what is a legacy? This is a beautiful line. It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. Um, and then at the top right here, he talks about America, the great unfinished symphony. And he's, he's talking about an unfinished symphony while there's complete silence, right? There's no music, there's no rhythm, there's just his, um, his voice. And you can feel it getting more and more frenzied until finally uh, the music resumes. I'm gonna skim down. I know it's gonna get a little, a little blurry as I skim down. But here we are with Burr. So the, the mistake um, that Burr makes is, as he says earlier, sorry, there's a little background noise. I just want to make sure everyone stays on mute for now. Um, he says earlier that uh, it's him or me, <laughs> right? It's him or me. And now he comes back and he realizes, uh, first of all, we get the return of that song, the death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints is a return of that song he had sung earlier, the wait for it, wait for it. So he has a return to his original sort of mindset, but he has new awareness that uh, I, I should have known. I was too young and too blind to see. I, I should have known that the world was wide enough for both him and me. Um, he survived, but he paid for it. The way that the, the, the villain actually pays in an, another price um, in the in the history and the way that we tell the story, so that's you know that's the Cain in Cain and Abel. Cain um, is the villain, is the first villain in history, and remains so. That's the mark of Cain. So we're going to do our Torah text now, and uh, we have a few texts. We're going to start with the primary text of the Torah. And focusing specifically on this concept of um, the world was wide enough. I mean, to say the 
world wide enough at the beginning of time is an understatement, right? There are two human beings, Adam and Eve, and then they have kids. They have Cain and Hevel. The Midrash says, actually, how were their women? How could they have procreated, you know, after this? Well, they each were born with a twin sister that wasn't explicitly uh, mentioned in the text. Okay, but there are plenty of, there's lots of space in the world. The world certainly was wide enough. And yet Cain gets this sense that it's him or me which is why I feel this is such a good analogy, the Aaron Burr-Hamilton analogy. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is the name of Cain. Um, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava have a son. I'm in the middle of verse one here, Vatahar Vateled et Cain. She bears Cain and calls him Cain because she, Chava, names him I have acquired, or here the translation is, I have gained a child or a man. I think another way of saying this was, oh my goodness, I made a person. <laughs> um, the first birth in humanity. But this word kinyan is the word of acquisition or word of ownership. Kaniti ish et Hashem. I've, I've created or I've, I, I own another human being. And of course, words in the Bible are very significant. I mean, names in the Bible are very significant. And uh, that, that aspect of Cain is sort of the hallmark of that attitude that he ends up having that drives him to kill his brother. Similarly, by the way, the name Hevel, Vatosef Laledet et Achiv et Hevel, it doesn't say why she called him Hevel, but the word Hevel, we know from later in the Tanakh, from the book of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, Hevel Havalim, right? Vanity of vanities. Hevel is nothingness. Hevel, quite literally in Hebrew, is breath. Hevel P is the breath of my mouth. So Hevel is here and gone, right? Hevel is the first person to be, to be murdered. So Cain is asserting ownership. Hevel is passive and then gone. And Hevel is the shepherd and Cain is the tiller of the soil or the farmer. And here we have the scene where after some time, Cain brings an offering from the, the fruit of the soil, from his crops, a gift to God. And Hevel too, the Hevel Hevi Gamhu Mibchorot Sono Michel Vehen brings the choicest of the flock, and Chel Vehen is the Chelev, the, the fat, the fat of the flock. And God, God likes Hevel's offering. Vayisha Hashem El Hevel Ve El Minchato. And in verse five, the El Kayin Ve El Minchato Lo Sha'a. God does not turn to Cain's offering. And this makes Cain very angry. The commentaries, of course, will ask why. Why is it that uh, he, he, you know, God, God accepted his offering, Hevel's offering, and not Cain's? Um, there's an assumption here that the the offerings were not were not quite brought equally. Um, Cain brought me pre ha'adama from the fruits of the land, while Hevel brought me bechorot, the firstlings, the most elite of the flock and the fats of the flock. So something, the choicest, the choicest and firstlings of his flock um, is the way the translation has it here. Hevel really took time um, to give generously to God and maybe Cain didn't. Um, Cain is angry. God approaches Cain first and says, why are you angry? Um, and, and asks Cain to take some responsibility. This is a very hard to parse verse, um, but it's, it means something along the lines of if you did something good, then you'll receive good. And if you sinned, you get what you deserve. In other words, Cain, take responsibility. Um, sin couches at the door is this phrasing here. It's, it's urging you on. Sin is urging you, but you should be master over sin. Um, there's a, a lot of commentary about this idea of, you know, Cain 
being the sinner who gave in to temptation. Um, <laughs> this story, I mean, we could do an entire year just on this story. So I really feel like we're zooming through a little bit, but I want to get through the sort of the big picture here and, and show you a couple of other texts as well. So um, Cain is, is offended, is angry. He struggles with his anger. And there seems to be some conversation now in verse eight. The text doesn't explicitly tell us what they said. Vayomer Cain el Hevel Achiv. Cain said to his brother Hevel, and it doesn't say what, it just says then they were in the field. Cain rose up and killed Hevel, his brother. I mean, the, the, the commentaries once again have a field day with this. Um, it could be that they have an argument and then Cain lures his brother into a field and kills him there. Um, we'll see in, in a moment another an, uh, another very explicit suggestion of what the argument was, what was the conversation between Cain and Abel that finally led one to kill the other. So we'll hold off on that for a moment. And then, of course, the very famous, these are all famous lines, but the very famous uh, verse, verse 9, Vayomer Hashem el Cain, God says to Cain, E Hevel Achicha, where is Hevel, your brother? Hint, hint, he is your brother. You should know to, to take care of him. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer should be yes. <laughs> yes, you should be your brother's keeper. Not your brother's killer, certainly. And, uh, and it goes on. God says, what have you done? The blood of your brother is calling out from the ground. Uh, I know exactly where your brother is. His blood is proof. And the Adama, the land, the earth comes back here again and again. The earth that Cain was working the earth and now the earth that swallowed his brother's blood. And now you are going to be cursed on this earth. Ve'ata, verse 11, Arur ata, cursed are you. You are cursed on this ground or more than this ground. It's, it, it's a hard translation here. Um, this ground that swallowed up your brother's blood because you instead are going to um, suffer the hardness of, of the soil of work. It's almost a, an extension of the curse to Adam Right, Adam was the first um, sinner, and then his punishment was You will, by the sweat of your brow, eat bread. You're going to have to work the field. It's not going to just, you know, bread isn't going to grow on trees anymore, so to speak. And now um, you're going to struggle even more on this earth, says God to Cain. When you work the soil, it won't yield to you. And what's more, you will be wandering. So it's something along the lines of, you'll no longer have a connection to the earth. You'll no longer have a relationship to the earth and you won't even have any land of your own. You will be a wanderer in the world. That's the punishment. Now, if if we're, if we're thinking about Cain's attitude as one of ownership, this is mine, 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 mine. And God should have shown me favor. And now, you know, and, and he was a worker of the, of the land. Now the punishment is you don't get to feel that sense of ownership at all. You don't get that mine feeling. So now there's the regret the regret that we saw on the face of Aaron Burr. I mean, the, the acting there is phenomenal. Um, he, he tries to approach Hamilton. They hold him back. He says, I, I get a drink. I hear wailing in the streets. He's clearly concerned for Alexander. He says, I heard that Eliza and Angelica were there by his side when he died. Um, and and Kyan sort of now in this moment also realizes the gravity of what he's just done. My, my 
he says, my punishment is too great. So another way of understanding this, actually, it's Rashi who says, this wasn't a statement, but a question. Is my sin so great that you can't forgive me, that you can't bear it, God? And, and now you've stricken me to wander the earth. I'm, I'm hidden from you. I'm banished from the ground and I'll be now a wanderer. I'm afraid for myself. I, I, will, I won't be safe. Someone else will find me and kill me. Um, he feels vulnerable. It's almost the way that they tell Burr, you better go and hide. They're out to get you now. People don't like you anymore. So Cain is somehow afraid for, for his life. And Vayomer lo Hashem, lachin kol hore Cain, shivatayim, you come, I, I will protect you. Anyone who kills Cain will have my vengeance. Time seven, shivatayim. Vayasam Hashem lakayin ot libilti hakot oto kol mos o. God made Cain uh, a mark of protection. So we'll get to what that mark of protection was. We'll get to that in a in another text. And thank you for the comment in the chat. Yes, it does remind of Jacob and Esav. Um, and the, the sibling rivalry, of course, continues throughout the Torah. Um, this is the first sibling rivalry, but it's a pattern all the way through, well, I should say throughout the book of Breshit. And it doesn't find reconciliation. This is a Rabbi Jonathan Sachs insight, which I find beautiful. Um, the answer of Hashomer Achianochi, am I my brother's keeper, doesn't get answered until the end of the book of Breshit, where Joseph's brothers show Joseph, in the way they treat Benjamin when he's threatened, they show Joseph that, yes, we are our brother's keeper. So Rabbi Sachs says, this question hangs over the entire book of Breshit as siblings are fighting one another. And by the way, not only brothers, but sisters, Rachel and Leah struggle with one another with jealousy. And it's finally only a tikkun, a tikkun, a, a, a fix, a redemption of this dynamic at the end of the book of Breshit. I think I may have mentioned that here at one point, in one class or another. So um, a couple of more texts just to flesh this out this very troubling scene of murder. First of all, what is this motivation that drives Cain to kill Hevel? Um, the commentator Seforno says that when, when, just before the murder, where it says, Vayiplu Panav, his face fell, is a very specific uh, reference to the face because he says that there was public shaming that happened, that this was a public act of rejection. And certainly that resonates with what was happening in the musical, right? It's, it's a, you know, something that you have to do to save face is to challenge someone to a duel. And Pain, even though there isn't many public, there isn't much public in the world, but he feels, um, he feels ashamed. So this combination between a, a sense of right, like I have a right to this, not you, and I have a right to God's favor, not you. And, uh, uh, and I'm embarrassed, drives him to violence. Um, but even more so, I want to really hone in on this him or me dynamic. Him or me, uh, and, and, and as opposed to the world is wide enough for both of us. So, um, sorry, here we go. Okay. Uh, this is the Midrash Rabbah, Breshit Rabbah, with regards to that conversation that is really not recorded at all. What did he say when it says, Vayomer Kain el Hevel Achiv? What did he say to his brother? So uh, this is an excerpt. It's a very long uh, piece of the Midrash. I took an excerpt here. Um, what were they arguing about? Alma hayu medainim. Amru. They said, let's divide up the world, you and me. <laughs> so this is about ownership. One takes the land or in the rabbinic 
um, imagination, you know, the land are the things that are not movable. The other takes movable property. So one person takes property, property, and the other person takes um, uh, objects. And then um, they started arguing. Once they had this conversation about who owns what, it led to argument. Dane Amar, this one said, Ara de'at ka'ema la didi. The ground you're standing on is mine. The Dane Amar, ma de'at la vesh didi. What you're wearing is mine, right? If I own all the land, then you can't stand here. Well, if I own all the things, then you can't wear that. <laughs> Dane Amar chalots. One said, okay, you take it off. The Dane Amar parach. The other one said, leave. <laughs> it's an impossible argument. If you assume that something is always owned by someone, then nobody gets anything. Mitochach, from this argument of ownership, of kinyan, that's the name Kain. From this argument about ownership, vayakam Kain el hevel achiv vayahar gehu. Cain rose against his brother and killed him. Then the Midrash goes on and says, well, no, it was different. Rabbi Yeshua de Sichnin b'shem Rabbi Levi, this rabbi and the name of that rabbi, right? That's how the Midrash is always recording the, the teachings and the names of the ones that they learned it from. It says, Shnehem natzlu et ha-karkaot, they both took land. Shnehem natzlu et ha-metaltalin, and they both took movable property. So it wasn't this at all. This wasn't how they tried to split things. Rather, what were they arguing about? Ve'almaha yumidayinim elaze amar, they were arguing about the location of the holy temple in the future. Uh, it's not unusual for a Midrash to have a sort of anachronistic argument like this, right? One said, you know, in the future, the Holy Temple is going to be going to be built on my property. It will be built in my tchum, in my uh, boundary, my property. And, uh, and the proof text for this, just interestingly, the proof text is to the word sadeh. Sadeh, the fact that they were in the field, refers to the Sadeh where the temple eventually was built. The word field, um, biblically speaking, refers to the holy temple. And the proof text is from the book of Micah that has a, a, a reference to Tzion Sadeh Techaresh, Zion in the destruction will become like a plowed field. So it's a tenuous um, uh, textual connection, but that's not unusual for the rabbis. So don't be too concerned for that. Uh, the point is it's still about land and territory and they get very territorial. So they start to, to, to argue and to fight. Um, he rose up against him. And by the way, there's another part in this Midrash that says, you see, we, he rose up, which means he was weaker. Hevel pinned him and then he had to get up and throw his brother off. And that's when he used a, a, a tool, right? Some kind of weapon against his brother. Because again, he was threatened. And then it goes on. They were arguing about women. How could they be arguing about women? It couldn't be that they were arguing about Eve. They were arguing about another twin sister. I said, I want, he said, I want her. <laughs> he said, I want her. <laughs> and uh, and they killed each other. What's interesting about all of these different possibilities is that um, the original text has to do with God finding favor. And in theory, God's favor is limitless, right? God can find favor in many, many sacrifices. But the Midrash creates these other sort of possibilities where it really has to be him or me. If this is my land, you can't live on it. Or if this there's one holy temple, it's going to be on my property, my territory. And that creates this dynamic of um, sparse resources. Actually, I remember reading this, um, a, a psychology article about sibling rivalry. And they said a great way to alleviate sibling rivalry is to show the two siblings that there's not a limit in resources. Like, you want this piece of cake? Look, there's three more pieces of cake. So you don't have to fight over this one. But if you're talking about the Holy Temple, well, there's only the Holy Temple. <laughs> um, and the scarcity of resource or the 
him or me dynamic that we see in Hamilton, um, his life or mine, right? That is what creates the conflict. Um, we're not going to read this inside. I just, I mentioned briefly that Rashi takes that verse about my punishment is greater than I can bear. And he shows, in quoting the Midrash, he shows that it's not a statement, but a question. Right? Is it impossible for you to bear my sin? Like, please, please, it's, it's, it's Cain basically begging for forgiveness. But I wanted to look at one last text before we open it up for conversation. And this is about the, the sign, the oat, the mark of Cain, the mark of Cain. So the Lord set a sign for Cain, Vayasem Hashem Lekain Ot. What was this mark? Several possible interpretations. Chakaklo Ot Bishmo Bimitzcho. One possibility is that God inscribed on Cain's forehead the letter of God's name. So the protection of God in some way, right on his forehead. Because what he was afraid of was being vulnerable to harm. And so God protects him in this divine way. Um, another interpretation Anyone who finds me will slay me. That's the quote from the verse. And what this refers to is who else is around? Not many other humans, but animals. The animals that I'm going to be wandering near are going to slay me. I'm vulnerable to their harm. There were not yet other human beings for him to be afraid of, rak aviv ve'imo, just his parents. And of course, them he wasn't afraid of. He didn't have to defend against them. So he must be concerned for defending himself against animals. Ela amar, ad achshav hayapachadati al kol hachayot. Until now, the fear of me was on all animals. Because it said in Breshit Umora Achem, this is an incomplete uh, citation, but in the English it says, and the fear of you shall be upon all beasts of the field. When God created the first human being, God said, be fruitful, multiply, dominate the earth, and the other species will fear you, right? You're in charge. You're the master of other species. But now I feel a new vulnerability because of my sin is what Cain is saying. Maybe I haven't lived up to you know, my humanity. I mean, there's something very deep in this. I, I haven't done what I was supposed to do. I see that I have sinned. And maybe because of that, animals will, will now kill me. I'll, I'll be vulnerable to animals. And so God puts a, a sign, a sign, a sign which is made the animals fear him again. There's another very different interpretation of this and a Midrash that comes up a bit later that um, Cain was afraid of the animals. So um, God wanted to make him look a little more like the animals and gave him a horn. This is a, quite a fantastical Midrash, but, but gave him a horn. And then later, um, Many generations later, Cain is still wandering the earth and his great-great-grandson, I can't remember the exact number of generations, but his great-great-grandson is hunting, Lemech is hunting and accidentally kills Cain because he thinks he's an animal because of his horn. <laughs> Um, but Cain is a tragic figure, right? Either way, whether it's God's name or some kind of fear of the animals or being one of the animals, he's cast out. He becomes a tragic figure and he becomes um, someone who survived, but he paid for it, right? To use the lines from that song. He survived, but he paid for it. And his line is really the line of, of villains or of, uh, of sin sinners. He becomes this um, model for sin. Thank you for the the chat comments about, yes, the houses in East Jerusalem. I mean, the, the question of ownership and ownership of land uh, certainly is contentious. And I, I don't want to get into politics or into, uh, you know, the, the, the rent and the tenants and so on. It's clearly a very 
old argument. Um, and sadly, Hamas are using it as an excuse to harm Israel, which they don't need any excuse to do. Hmm. Um, but I, I'd love to uh, invite comments about this, this Cain and Abel or this him or me, um, and even the dynamic of a duel, right? Someone's gonna die and someone's gonna live. And uh, it forces both sides to be on the defensive. Um, and of course, Hamilton, who in theory is the compassionate one and aims his pistol to the sky, is the one who's killed. So I see Gloria Aronoff, I see your hand, and I see Bunny, and I see David, um, and then we'll see who else after that. Gloria, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I know Good we have morning. two Glorias, that's why I said yes. Gloria Aronoff. Thank you. Okay, I, I, it's a fascinating story today, and I'm, I'm struck with that so early in the Torah, we're faced with such a, a deep lesson. I think God is jumping up to PhD level when we're really in grade one, because I think what this, this um, situation is trying to teach is that relationships is not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. That if one person gets something that the other one is necessarily losing something. And that's a concept that is so advanced. I'm kind of surprised because human beings are just new at this. So I think it's, it's teaching altruism, and that's a very hard concept for mm. people to grasp. You have to be very mature and very experienced in life to know well, that you have I, to I, learn to be happy for the other person when, when they get something. So I, I You know what, Gloria? That's why teaching these early stories to little kids can only get us so far. Yeah. That's why we have to revisit them as adults. That's why the Torah is not a kid's book or not only a kid's book, right? That's, yes. I think that what you're saying, that's what adult education is all about is that we're going to get layers that we could never right. have seen. But it, it already is starting at such a high level. It, mm -hmm. It's really a, a very um, complex uh, dynamic for human beings to understand. Thank you. That's my comment. Thank you. Bunny? Um, <clears throat> comment and a question, but my comment first is how God uses the marking um, to protect um, Cain is very similar to God making the mark for Passover, that they should be protected. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, That's yeah. right. So, uh, so I'm wondering if there are other areas of time where God uses a mark for protection, because I found this similarity was very simple. I mean, to me, it, it, it rang. The other question I wanted to ask is a little off kilter, but there is a sense of there is a, a syndrome or whatever of suicide by others, you know, where a man draws his gun because he wants to die and he knows the police will kill him so he doesn't have to do it himself. And I oh, kind of wow. felt that uh, Hamilton was um, in some ways committing suicide by forcing Burr to kill him. And I'm wondering if there are other instances in the tour where this kind of action happens. It was just a question that's been on my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, actually there is. So both of the questions are really, are excellent. The, the ot, the same word ot sign is used at Passover with the blood on the doorpost that's gonna be an ot, mm -hmm. a sign that protects them. And I'm thinking about the ot, the sign of the rainbow which is a sign okay. of God's protection as well. It's not for one particular person, but it's a sign of God's protection of the whole earth that God will not again, bring a flood and destroy humanity. So I like that connection. And um, yes, there's this, in the story of Saul, King Saul, who you know is right before King David and he's a tragic king. He only is king for, I believe two years and he sees he's about to lose in battle and he'll be killed. And he wants to fall on his sword. He falls on his sword. He doesn't succeed in, in killing himself. And then he begs for mercy from the, the Na'ar, the um, lad who is his attendant who agrees and kills him for him. So it's not exactly what you're saying, exactly, yeah. but but Shmuel the prophet gets really mad at at the Naar and says you shouldn't never. Or was it Shmuel or it was David maybe at that point? I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the story. But you should never lay a hand on uh, the anointed king of God, and and that's still considered murder. But Saul did try to commit suicide and needed 
needed help to do so. It's not exactly what you describe with the with yeah. the duel, it but it, that's what it made me think. Of. Yeah, it is, it's it's interesting. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, and I don't think. I don't know if that connects at all to, to Cain and Abel. That's where, it, it, yeah, it's a little bit far afield, but but certainly with Hamilton, you have to ask yourself, why is he shooting to the sky? What does he think is going to happen? What exactly does he imagine will happen? And he told his son to do that. His son got killed. I mean, it's uh, it makes no sense. Um, and throughout, you know, throughout the, the musical, we also, we, we get the feeling that Hamilton knows he's on borrowed time. Um, uh, that one of the songs is 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 about him writing and writing and writing these Federalist Papers and all kinds of things and it's you know why do you write like you're running out of time write day and night like you're running out of time uh, and and it it is uh, it is that he he run he knows he's running out of time he's imagined death so much it feels more like a memory that's the line there right he he knows he's gonna die I don't know why he seems to be having a hand in it in some way. Uh, but he's also blinded by jealousy. Who knows why? He, that's why he accepts the duel. David, I want to let you chime in here. Go yeah, ahead. I just have a simple question. I'm not familiar with early American history, but is Hamilton the show faithful to history? Okay. Okay. So the historians were not so happy with the show. Maxine, Max is going like, mm. um, it's based on a biography. I, I, I don't remember the name of the author. Author, a more recent, a relatively recent biography. Max, are you saying the name because you know it? No. Okay. I have no idea. Uh, we can look that up for next time or anybody can Google it. If you Google it, you can put it in the chat if you find it. Um, and certainly Lin-Manuel Miranda in writing the, the musical took some liberties to, well, make it more appealing to a stage audience. I'll give you one example. Apparently um, Angelica gets married earlier. I, there's some, something with the Angelica and Eliza love triangle really didn't happen the way it's presented in the musical. Uh, there are inconsistencies like that all the way through. So some historians were quite miffed. I think other historians were able to recognize, and this is honestly how I feel about it, that it's a piece of art. It's um, the same way we might read a book that is historical fiction uh, and, and it's been, Thank you, Lane, put it in. Oh, both people. Okay, and Max, Ron Cherno was the author of the biography of Hamilton that Lin-Manuel Miranda based his musical on. And um, and I, what I was going to say is, you know, history teachers have, have him to thank for getting kids interested in history. You know, we can make a really good history course based around looking at the inconsistencies and learning what really happened. Um, and I know that, you know, for, for Lin-Manuel Miranda, it was really appealing to find one of these, you know, founding fathers, as we call them, of, of the United States, who he felt really was a, um, rising from the bottom and, um, and was an immigrant. And I think he wanted to tell that story, you know, the immigrant story is kind of a hip story to tell. Um, so, you know, he took thematics and blew them up and, Definitely based in history, but but not fully on facts. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's, it's good. It's a good question, um, and thanks. Susan is showing us the uh, is that the Wikipedia article? Okay, so everyone can can do your own googling and Wikipediaing and learn more as well. Um, Hamilton, the Revolution. Ah, thank you. Okay, is that another book, Max? Hamilton, the Revolution. It's the book that Lin-Manuel Miranda wrote about the musical and the making of the musical. It's fascinating. That's wonderful. Thank you. Other comments about what we've studied today at all? I wanted to show you, actually, we're not going to do another song, but I wanted to show you an article, as I mentioned, by uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. So I'm going to, you know what, I'll screen share it, but before I screen share it, I'll also put the link right here into the chat so you can read through it yourselves. And now I'll do the screen sharing. So you don't have to open it yourself right now, or you can open it and save it for later. Click on it if you want to have it for later. 
Um, as I believe I mentioned, oh, one second, I need to, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, give me one minute. Okay, doing this again. Rabbi Sachs writes about violence in the name of God. Violence in the name of God. I mean, a more apt conversation we couldn't find for today. Um, he, he writes about suicide bombings, 9-11, and so on. And he brings it to Cain and Abel. The connection between religion and violence is set out at the beginning of, biblical, of the biblical story of mankind. The first two human children, Cain and Abel, bring an offering. Abel's is accepted. Cain's is not. The first recorded act of worship leads to the first murder, the first fratricide. Religion, the Torah implies, is anything but safe. At its best, it lifts human beings to become little lower than angels. At its worst, it leads them to become the most destructive life form on earth. What I think he's trying to say is that it is potent. It can lead us to our best selves or our worst selves. And he goes through these theories of religion and violence. I'm going to skip down. You can read this on your own, as I sent you the, the link. Um, but he gets back to Cain and Abel here at the bottom. Um, sacrifices were attempts to appease God. Uh, do, 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 do. There is no way of telling the difference externally. There can be two offerings, Cain's and Abel's, that look alike. They are both acts of worship. It's trying to say one is selfish and one is um, generous, right? One is an act of self-effacement in the presence of the creator. So that's the generous one. The other is a Nietzschean will to power. How do you tell the difference? By the presence of anger when things don't turn out as you wished. The fact that Cain gets angry means that he's got his ego wrapped up in it. That's how we know it wasn't a sincere offering to God. He's, he, it, it's a selfish offering is what Rabbi Sachs is saying. I'm sorry, I know this is a very dense article that I'm zipping us through quickly, um, but uh, he uses this, actually, I wanted to show you one more thing. I'll stop this screen share. He uses um, this concept of, of sibling rivalry or sibling violence also in his book. This is his book, Not in God's Name. Um, confronting religious violence. And he says he, he wrote the book after 9-11. Was it after 9-11? Now I can't find the publication date. I believe it was. Okay, there's another edition in 2015. Doo, doo, doo. Uh, but um, it, it goes through the sibling rivalries in the Torah, not really starting with Cain and Abel, but with Ishmael and Yitzchak. So talk about a relevant concept. Um, and he goes through all of the narratives of the siblings, starting with Yitzchak and Ishmael, and then going to Esav and Yaakov, et cetera, et cetera. And he shows that even though, you know, Yitzchak is chosen, so to speak, Yitzchak is chosen to, to continue Abraham's mission. He says, Yishmael is never rejected. Yishmael is a son too. And he shows that there's sort of a counter narrative happening throughout that the world is wide enough for two children of Abraham. <laughs> the world is wide enough for both Isaac and Ishmael. And he's not saying, you know, he's not, I don't know what you might call a lefty lefty here. Um, he's simply saying we don't need violence. We don't need to choose us or them. Uh, we don't need a duel in order to get our mission as a people. And, um, and unfortunately, we've seen religious violence on both sides of this conflict. You know, Jews are beating people up and um, as are Arabs. And again, I'm not trying to make an equivalency and there are lots of problems in media reporting a, a, a real imbalance um, because they're, they're not calling out you know, indiscriminate rocket fire from Hamas as, as terrorist acts. So I'm not making any equivalence, equivalency there between um, indiscriminate rocket fire and a measured me military response. 
I'm simply saying that um, Rabbi Sachs, you know, uses this dynamic of the siblings to show that we can both exist in the world. We can both exist in the world if only we can believe that it doesn't have to be, you know, him or me, that the world is wide enough. The world is wide enough. So I'd like to leave you with that. My friends, I'm a little sad because next week we're gonna get to the end of the musical. Um, we will we'll hear the last, the last song, um, which is who lives, who dies, who tells your story. So we're gonna be talking about storytelling and narrative. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, in the month of June, there's already two Wednesdays, I couldn't make it. So rather than do, you know, off again and on again and off again, we're just gonna, we're gonna bring this to its neat conclusion and tie it in a bow as best we can next week. And the truth is I don't usually offer a Wednesday class through the summer, but maybe I can do a couple sessions. I'm, I'm gonna be away a little bit. I know some other people are gonna be away.